thank you all for joining Emily and I for the first of this uh, Teaching Reset 2022 workshop series. Um, I, I think I know all of you, but my name is Laura Smith and I'm an instructional designer with City. Um, Emily, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Emily Rush and I'm also an instructional designer with City. Uh, yeah, thanks, Emily. So we're going to be sort of co-presenting this uh, workshop. Um, and this, again, is the first of a series of three workshops on this topic uh, of student-centered learning. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the student-centered classroom. Um, so uh, as always with uh, the sessions that I um, lead, I'm, I'm happy for you guys to chime in, to ask questions, to use your mic or your chat should you uh, want clarification or have a question about anything. I think Emily uh, would agree that we would like to this to be mostly informal and um, interactive. So please feel free uh, to chime in. Um, this, as I mentioned, the session is being recorded um, and it will be posted to our city YouTube page should you wanna go back to it at any time. Um, and we hope to leave about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A um, and feedback. So um, that's the plan. <laughs> we don't wanna talk the whole time, of course. Um, so again, this is the first of a three-part series today we're talking about the student-centered classroom. Um, there are two more that are coming up and I just wanted to give you guys kind of a sneak peek at those. Hopefully you've received those invitations and we can be and we'll be able to join us for the remainder. Um, on March 15th, Matt and Peg are gonna talk about collaborative learning. And I believe that that's gonna be focused on group learning, both in person and virtually. So managing breakout rooms, group dynamics, that sort of thing. And then uh, Bronca and Lynette are going to talk about interactivity on March 24th. And I see Lynette is with us. <laughs> so maybe Lynette wants to briefly talk about or mention or not <laughs> what you guys are gonna be focusing on. Or I can just say Lynette. <laughs> I think it's on tech tools, right? To facilitate interactivity. That's correct, sorry. Okay. No, 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 sorry. I put you on the spot, I apologize. Um, so we'd like to get this started with uh, a kind of interactivity, right? Um, with a uh, something I'm calling a student-centered -center -centered strategy in practice. Um, and that is a poll using poll everywhere. So as you can see here, you can either join by web using uh, pollev.com or by text um, to uh, Laura, K Laura Smith 457-22333. And I'm gonna go ahead and go to that question. Um, let me know if you're having any issues seeing my screen. Um, so what this is, we, we're hoping to generate a word cloud um, around this topic of student-centered teaching. So the question is, what do you think are the key elements of student-centered teaching? Um, if you would just type a word or a phrase or anything uh, to get us started. Listening, great. Anyone else? Are you guys able to? Oh, awesome, okay. Listening, oriented, objective. I know we don't have a ton of people here, so we can't create a huge word cloud, but hopefully we can put my cursor around on the screen. I don't know. All right, so you guys can see your contributions now, this word cloud that we've created, and maybe we'll come back. If there's still a delay, we can come back later in the session and take another look. Um, but these are all really great contributions. Um, and we'll be talking about a lot of this, specifically interactivity or interaction later in the discussion uh, or in the workshop. Emily, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, not right now, thanks. Okay. All right, so let's go back to... Do 
my presentation. Okay. All right. So today, this is the overview of today's workshop. Um, so it's kind of a three-part series, all centered around the concept of, or three parts kind of set up, all centered around the concept of student, the student-centered classroom. Um, so we're going to start with setup, essentially setting up your room, whether it be you know face to face or virtual, and how you might want to organize that. Um, then we'll get into delivery, and that will be a bit on lecturing best practices, um, as well as Emily will be talking uh, ex more extensively about cognitive load and presentation design. Um, and then we'll just briefly talk about interactivity. It's kind of a sneak uh, peek at what's to come. Um, because I know that sessions two and three are going to get much more into interactivity, but we'll have just a couple of strategies that we want to talk about uh, in context of the proposed setup that we've uh, developed for the face-to-face -face and virtual classroom. And keep to mind that these keep keep in mind that these uh, these strategies we're suggesting work equally well. Well, maybe not equally well, but well for both the face-to-face -face and virtual classrooms, because I realize you guys are, you know, teaching um, varied uh, modalities, especially as we hopefully <laughs> move out of this sort of uh, COVID lockdown we've been in for some time. So what is student-centered learning? And I'd like to start off, as always, with a definition, um, because uh, we want to know where we're at, right, and, and, and what, how we will move through this uh, presentation. So I have the, a concrete definition from Ed Glossary uh, that student-centered learning is a wide variety of educational programs, learning experiences, instructional approaches, and academic support strategies that are intended to address the distinct learning needs, interests, aspirations, or cultural backgrounds of individual students and groups of students. And for me, um, that really, the, the key words for this are the distinct learning needs, individual students, groups of students, right? So we're looking at um, developing and administering learning materials that are student-driven, student-centered, student-focused. Um, I don't think we can talk about student-centered learning without talking about active learning. And to me, that's a very closely related term, so I wanted to bring in that definition as well. Um, and active learning as defined by uh, Vanderbilt University's Center for Teaching is, quote, instructional activities involving students in doing things and thinking about what they are doing. And really, the doing is a big part of that for me, right? It's active. You are actively applying something you're learning um, by through exercises and activities. And then this notion of thinking about what they are doing, I think that's really interesting, that sort of, sort of metacognitive approach to active learning, this idea of you know, reflecting in the act of doing um, and being aware of one's thinking as you are learning um, I, is also I, as an essential part of active learning. So, our recommendations are going to be sort of focused around these concepts here um, and how you can, you know, develop a student-centered classroom and really integrate active learning into it. So I'm going to start off with just the basics of classroom management. And this is not to say that these are the only ones because there are certainly many more. But when I think of the basics, when uh, when I want to put my class together, right? These are the key things that really come to mind. And this will just be sort of a, a launching pad for what we'll be continuing to discuss. And, and we'll be getting into a lot of these in greater detail. But um, just at a high level, obviously you want to be organized, right? Um, you want to make sure all your ducks are in a row and you're ready to teach. If you remember nothing else, um, I think really the key words from this session or from this part of the session is break it up, right? Don't lecture the entire time. Um, and we'll talk more about how one might do that. Um, design matters, right? How you organize your visuals and deliver them is important in a, for many reasons. And Emily's gonna talk more about that and how it re relates to cognitive load. 
um, include breaks. That may seem like a given, and I know I'm sure that all of you already do that, right? Um, but we all need bathroom and coffee breaks, and maybe our dogs need to go out, and maybe our kids need some attention, right? So it's important to include breaks, and there's a lot of wonderful ideas out there for how one might do that. Um, include interactivity, the key word of the day, right? Letting students do things, right? Either on their own or with one another, or, or interacting with you. And then letting students lead and help. You know, you don't have to do this all yourself. You can share the load. Um, let them lead. Let them present or co-present. Let them help you, right? Maybe it's in terms of monitoring the chat for you um, and, uh, and bringing you questions that are relevant to the topic. So um, consider ways you can uh, share the load with your students. So uh, in terms of the setup, right, we're going to talk about this is just one of many ways you might organize your session. So I'm sure, you know, we've all been in that position where we're handed a two or three hour class and we're like, oh, my goodness, how am I going to fill this time? Um, you and I, as well as your as well as your students may be overwhelmed by the prospect of having to teach for two to three hours and how to organize that. Um, because this is often, you know, and, and you might default to lecture, right? Because this is often how we were taught. Um, and so we tend to wanna do the same. Um, here is just one of uh, many ways you might break it up or divide it. And this is, it has been adapted from the um, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I really like this approach because as you can see, it divides each of the sessions into no more, each of the, the segments of the class into no more than 30 minute intervals. Um, for example, you start off with a warm up and review. Um, that might be a review of concepts introduced in the previous class and last week. Um, and since retrieval or recalling what you've previous le previously learned is really key for learning and for long-term memory storage, um, devoting a portion of the class to review um, is, is, can be really uh, impactful. Then they have guided discussion for 25 minutes. Um, we'll talk more about an example of guided discussion later in the session. Um, but think about, again, how you might, um, you know, how you might lead a, or have a student lead a guided discussion, um, noticing that the, the, the faculty hasn't even started lecturing yet until, you know, an hour into the session, right? Because we have a break, and then we have a 30-minute lecture and Q&A, right? Um, so you don't have to launch into lecturing. Um, you can have time for other types of activities that are just as meaningful as, or maybe more so than lecture. Then we have another 30 minutes for group work where students may break out into individual groups and you can circulate among them, uh, followed by a regroup or a kind of discussion with the larger class to share. And we'll have, we'll talk about strategies that pertain to that. And then wrapping up with a wrap up. And this might be an opportunity for you to go back to what you introduced at the start as a kind of bookend approach to your class session. Um, it also could be a time where you introduce a kind of ungraded formative assessment, say like a quick knowledge check quiz or a minute paper, um, a, a short kind of uh, activity that again, applies the content that students had been uh, learning throughout the session. So again, one way of going about it, but I think a nice way of breaking it up that includes plenty of opportunities, both for lecture, which is valuable, and also for um, group work and interaction. And then one more before I hand it over to Emily. Um, we're now gonna be moving on to the second part of the session where we talk about delivery or the art of lecturing. Um, and again, there are so many other, there's so many things you could consider. This is not a definitive list by any means, 
Um, but these are some things that I often think about, you know, when I was teaching those two and three hour classes, right? Um, get to class and be early, uh, be ready to, uh, to present. You may wanna get to class 10 minutes early, um, just maybe talk to those students who showed up early um, and maybe that's where you could tease out some issues and answer some questions. Um, be intentional and transparent. Uh, always explain to students, you know, why you're doing something and what the value of that activity is. Maybe refer back to your learning objective so that they know why this is, is activity is important um, and how it reinforces what you want them to learn in that in that module and maybe in the class overall. <laughs> be aware of student inattention. And clearly I'm probably not very aware of that right now because I've been talking a lot and I want to wrap it up. <laughs> but um, you know, be aware if you're losing them and you need to um, interject some uh, uh, Q&A or whatnot. Personalized telling stories. T storytelling is one of the best ways I think of, of, of making an impact, right? Because we, you know, as humans, we respond to stories. Uh, one thing I really love is using callbacks or, you know, re re repeating certain things throughout um, because we tend to learn through repetition and retrieval. So constantly sort of reinforcing those key points, maybe it's your objective, um, is, is important. Um, covering only a few points, asking questions, just not giving answers, and being flexible. If, if COVID hasn't taught us anything else, right, it's the value of being flexible and adaptable to the circumstances. Um, so I think that that's also key. But I'm gonna wrap it up really quickly um, because I wanna make sure Emily has enough time. So um, this is sort of a, a prelude to that, using effective and well-designed visuals. And Emily will talk further about that. All right, thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, so now I wanna talk a little bit about how we can additionally support learners by being cognizant of the ways that instructional materials and approaches impact their cognitive load. So I'll begin first by defining or giving my definition of cognitive load, which um, at its heart I'd say it's closely related to processes involving memory and information processing. And we can think of memory and information processing in three basic ways. Um, according to Atkinson and Schifrin, uh, there are three main components to information processing. So the first is sensory memory, and that's the information that we're constantly getting bombarded with all the time that we're awake. Um, so different kinds of information and sensory stimuli. Um, and in terms of sensory memory, our, our we, our brains have a large capacity for uh, sensory memory, but it lasts a very short time, perhaps as little as a quarter to a half a second. So uh, the, the time that we process and retain that sensory memory can be very brief. And that's something that we'll think about and I'll expand upon in a little bit. Working memory is what essentially processes or disregards information from our sensory memory. And it's related, a lot of people think of it as short-term memory. The last is uh, long-term memory. And that's where we store information that's been categorized and moved into organizational structures called schemas. Uh, today, I'm just really gonna focus on sensory memory and working memory, even though long-term memory is of course very important to learning. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so just to recap, cognitive load then pertains to the amount of information that our working memory can process at one time. And cognitive load at its most basic level is often broken into three components. Uh, so the first is intrinsic load. And this is the kind of cognitive load that results from the inherent complexity of any material that learners need to process. This intrinsic load is generally thought to be unchangeable, although we can influence it slightly with the way that we teach and design materials. And a good example of intrinsic load is a basic multiplication problem. 
it has the same intrinsic load that it does for me as an adult that it does for a third grader or fourth grader who's learning basic multiplication. It doesn't change. The second aspect of cognitive load is germane load. And germane load can be thought of as uh, the resources or the, the mental resources that are involved in integrating new knowledge like multiplication into an existing mental framework. And germane load is variable. It can be influenced by factors like the learner's level of expertise. So the germane load is higher for a novice, the third grader who's learning multiplication, than it is for me trying to do a, a, you know, seven times seven or something like that. And then the last part of cognitive load is extraneous load. And extraneous load can be unnecessary or distracting information. Uh, more research in the age of, age of COVID has also just said it's, it's also excessive novelty, stress, anxiety, any of those factors that are reduce our capacity for learning and focusing on learning tasks and factors that don't contribute to learning objectives. All right, so in short, in terms of all those, um, as I said, intrinsic load of learning content is generally unchangeable, but there's a lot we can do as designers and instructors to manage germane and extraneous loads. And in particular, we can do that be, by being intentional about the way that we present information. And so here we're going to come back to a version of the slide we've already seen and uh, talk a little bit more about briefly some theories about how we process different information. So going back to that sensory memory, there's actually, according to Mayer and Moreno, there's two channels that we use to process sensory memory. The first is verbal or auditory, and the second is visual or pictorial. So essentially there's this idea that we have two channels for processing sensory information, and they are separate, but they can sometimes be competing. And at any time, either channel can be overwhelmed. If, um, if information is presented effectively, however, if we use both channels, it can maximize working memory. And that's part of the goal of moving from sensory memory to working memory to long-term memory. Uh, the challenge, as I mentioned before, is that working memory has a limited capacity so that most learners have a capacity for, to manage like anywhere between five and nine pieces of information, depending on their level of experience or things like metacognition. So in terms of this presentation today and taking this information outside of uh, today's segment is that what we want to do is keep in mind the factors that impact cognitive load in our course design and especially in our multimedia use in classes. And we can do this by optimizing learners' sensory and working memories by minimizing extraneous details. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, what I'd like to do is talk about some strategies for reducing overwhelm. And the first strategy is whenever possible to keep it simple. Uh, so for example, eliminate extraneous information, things that don't support learning outcomes. And also, at least I used to teach and I find it, it's hard to, but um, eliminating those seductive details, which are interesting facts, but that might not be exactly on topic. Uh, a second thing that we can do is to try to limit excessive use of text or lots of bullet points. And if we find that there's too much text on a slide, it can be overwhelming for the student, especially if they're reading the text while someone is speaking. We also wanna be careful about the quality of graphics. So whenever possible, we want to select quality graphics that are clear and easy to read, probably not overly detailed. While we're presenting graphics, it's useful to um, provide verbal or visual clues to tell uh, learners where they should direct their attention in terms of a graphic. And if we're using complex graphics, we want to pre-train students by defining key concepts or um, key terms. 
And a lot of the same things happen with charts. So we always want to use quality charts that are clear, but not overly detailed. If they are detailed, we want to make sure that we build in time for students to look at the charts and to reflect upon the material. Uh, something really important, I think, is in terms of cognitive load and slide design is to choose fonts for readability. So um, some of the best fonts are sans serif fonts. And we also want to make sure that the, uh, the font is sufficiently large for all readers to see. I personally like to use 18 to 24 point font, which seems really large, but 12 or 10 point font is really small. And then the last thing I want to talk about is accessibility which is a huge, huge topic. So I'm just going to hit what I think are some key points in the context of today's discussion. And the first uh, relates to the previous thing about fonts is we want to make sure that when we are putting any text on a PowerPoint that there is a sufficient contrast between the font and its background. If you're not sure if there's a sufficient contrast, uh, this site that I just put in the chat, the Web Aim Contrast Checker, is a great tool. Um, you just have to put in the color code, which is a hex code for the font in the background, to make sure that it would be readable to all users. Um, other things that I would suggest is reconsider using yellow highlights or red or green text, which can be hard for some readers to see. And then lastly, um, Think about refraining from underlining text unless it's a hyperlink or um, a bibliographic reference or citation. Okay, how about uh, the next slide, please? Okay, so I've been talking a lot. What I would like to do is take a pause and think about what slide design and cognitive overload might look like. And so I'd appreciate it if you'd be unwilling to pop in the chat or unmute yourself and tell me a little bit about what are some reasons that this slide is overwhelming to look at in a lecture context, especially if I'm talking continuously while showing this slide. I'll jump in. It's way too busy. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's very busy. Yeah. Um, Someone else said something about paragraph style in the chat. Yeah, the detailed graph. The, the graph itself in another context might be great, but it's it's kind of competing with the text. There's a lot of colors going on. Yeah, so the it's too small. too small. Yes, it's definitely too small. At least I would have trouble seeing it if I were in the back of the classroom, that's for sure. Great. Okay, yeah, well intended, but too much. I love that. So it's it's the idea is there. Someone really wanted to include a lot of information, but it needs to be segmented, as Laura talked a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. It could be separated into multiple slides. Okay, yeah, those are great. So um, hopefully this helps crystallize some of what I talked about in terms of imagining if you are in a lecture and someone's talking to you about driving and cognitive overload and they show you this slide even though m many of us are you know very comfortable driving the slide itself is overwhelming and so that impacts how we are able to process the material um, and i i think that's it so i'm going to pause if there are not any questions or questions in the chat and i think laura is going to tell us a little bit about interactivity in the classroom. Great, thanks, Emily. Um, are there any questions? I know we've, uh, again, <laughs> we've been talking a lot. You guys have any questions or any uh, requests for clarification on anything we've talked about so far? And well, as a just, reminder, there will be Q&A at the end. Yep, go ahead. Oh, I just had a suggestion. I know that uh -huh. when, when one of my students, um, when we have like what's working, what's not working sessions about what they like and dislike about, a current course or a current term, they said that they liked when you had like those side comments or something that isn't quite relevant to what's happening on the slide, or you want to say something extra to put it in the notes pages of the PowerPoint. 
And then that way they can read it on their own time and they, and, you know, they can get a little bit more clarity or uh, provide an extra example. And the students like that so that they can, they know that's not part of what, you know, being on the screen, but, you know, could be helpful or a tidbit. So I know the students kind of like that a little bit better too. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Emily, did you want to say anything about that? No, I just want to say thank you. That was great. I mean, the the literature does say it's about 50-50 split for seductive details that half of the learners find it useful and about half find it completely distracting. So I really love your solution. That's great. I think particularly since a lot of students do use like note taking apps that that utilize uh, uh, PowerPoints or Google Slides and the notes section of those slides to to record their notes, whether it be for in-class sessions or asynchronously. Any other questions, comments? I would, I just, this is Peg, I'd like to just yeah. jump in with a comment if I could. Sure. I find that um, the more that we can get war stories and well, war stories is a very unfortunate turn of phrase, but you know, stories that have happened to the instructors, things that actually teaching is, should be like telling a story. And so mm -hmm. leaving some of those details into the storytelling part of it and and inserts the, the instructor into the course more and mm -hmm. makes them seem more approachable, more personable, um, more likable, and it gives the student some connectivity. So as much as you can, instead of typing all those stories out onto the page, talk them through them. That's a really great point, Peg. And I think this connects to something as a team we've been talking about this, this importance of, you know, being vulnerable, right? And um, uh, and it, it and being, you know, present and engaged, right? And that which is a, you know, storytelling is a part of that, right? And um, personalizing your material uh, and, and, and it being transparent. Of course, these are all different kind of concepts, but I I um I feel like they're all somewhat interconnected because um, it it really shows a that you're there right and you're present and um, hey, you have a firsthand experience of this stuff. Yep, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I I, I do have another Hi. comment. I have a comment too. Mm -hmm. um, I was listening to what Ladonna was saying, and I asked the same course. I like to do that around midterm uh, to the class of what's working, what's not working, etc. And it's interesting. I do give uh, small assignments uh, for uh, students to come back and share their assignment with the class, and some students really go all out and uh, take more time than really is there for them to take. And one of, the, one of the comments from some of the students said, well, they want to hear and do more hands-on and instead of hearing from the students doing their assignments. So I, I thought mm. that was interesting. They really value the, the time mm. of like hands-on. Yeah. That's great. I mean, that's just one of those really effective um, means of interactivity is having those, um, you know, midpoint feedback or requests for feedback, uh, you know, at any point during the semester, but, you know, in the middle of it or at the end is a wonderful way of gauging your students, um, uh, the effectiveness of your, of your teaching and, and getting some really good suggestions from them. Um, so back to back to our, our presentations. I want to make sure we leave enough time for um, continued uh, Q and A. Um, you know, why do interact? Why integrate interactivity? Um, it works, right? And and I wanted you know, it's always important to ground our teaching practice in evidence based research. So I wanted to bring in this just one of many. Um, studies around the effectiveness of integrating active learning um, in your course. And this is from a uh, 2014 meta-analysis of 225 studies comparing a variety of STEM courses that used both the traditional lecture approach and active learning. And you can see um, by looking at this chart that the probability of failure among those students across the board was much higher for those traditional lecture classes 
versus those that integrated active learning. And this is not to say that the act, those that integrated active learning weren't also lecturing, um, but it, it added an element of interactivity to the course that was, as you can see, quite effective for student success. So now we're gonna talk about uh, a, some, some just quick strategies that you could incorporate at different points during that, say two, three hour lecture. And Emily's gonna jump in and talk about interactivity during lecture. Right, so I'm just going to introduce a few very doable strategies for incorporating interactivity and strategies that I think are sort of low stakes and require minimal preparation on the instructor's part. Um, the, the first one is just to remember to take a pause. So maybe every 12 to 18 minutes of lecture to try and pause for about two to three minutes. And a possible activity is just to encourage your students to discuss and revise their notes in pairs if they are in a face-to-face -face classroom. If you're in a virtual setting, you might just give students a, a moment to look over their own notes. And I would say the value in this is that allows students to pause for reflection and gives them an opportunity to, um, to seek clarification if, if they need to. And next slide, please. All right, uh, the second one is similar. So again, it involves a pause. In this case, using retrieval practice is um, it's an opportunity for the instructor to, again, pause from the lecture and perhaps ask students to summarize or explain key points from that lecture. Uh, instructors could do this by asking volunteers in the class to share their answer, or if you're feeling like you want to try a um, a technology-based tool, you might use something like Poll Everywhere that we uh, showed earlier in this session as a useful way to check students' understanding. And so you could also sort of with Poll Everywhere, you can see more broadly how the class is understanding material and you can also use it anonymously. So it's a low stakes and often very low pressure for students, but a good kind of pulse check in terms of their understanding. And next slide, please. And then the last is maybe a good way to open up a session or to close a session, and that is informal writing or reflection. And as an instructor, you might do this by asking your students a question that requires them to think a little bit more critically about their learning by doing things like explaining content, making connections between the lecture material from that day and another day, or trying to fit content into existing knowledge structures. Um, you could do this by giving the students just a few minutes to produce handwritten or typed responses, and then collect them to think about how you would use that information for future sessions or um, pause and Oh, use it to open up a discussion or q and A Q&A within that particular class session. Oh, I love that. Yeah, Peg suggested have them write an exam question. That's I think that's a great way to get students really thinking about material and how they might apply it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I I considered that Peg in line with that. Also, perhaps collaborating on a study guide or something like yeah. that. Right. So again connecting or, or part of that retrieval process and prediction, right? Which is another key element of learning. Um, so thanks, Emily. I'm gonna talk a little bit about interactivity apart from lecture and just to go back to that proposed two hour course uh, class structure. Um, I'm gonna be looking specifically at, you know, a, a technique you may use for guided discussion um, as well as uh, for group work. And again, this is just kind of a preview because Peg and uh, Matt are gonna go much more into this in the subsequent um, workshop, um, but just a couple of suggestions um, to uh, hopefully pique your interest and get you thinking about um, integrating a, a, a group work in your course. So, um, 
In terms of group work, um, guided discussion uh, is the first of one we'll talk about, and that is a, you know, an active learning technique, um, which again, we've been talking about all along. Um, it can be instructor or peer led, um, and it gives the students the opportunities to really uh, apply the course material and really put it in their own words, right? To uh, personalize, right, that learning. So it encourages that level of personalization, also critical and higher order thinking because it's requiring students, they really process and integrate that into their existing knowledge. Um, in, this, in this scenario, the instructor becomes more of a facilitator, right? Instead of a lecturer, kind of the, what you've heard, you may have heard of the concept of the guide on the side, as opposed to the state, sage on the stage, right? Um, so the, the instructor guides the student um, in their discovery of in construction of new knowledge. Um, and guided discussion can be used to review content previously introduced, um, reflect on that uh, new content, and maybe even make predictions about new content and new material that may be introduced in a subsequent point uh, in that class or in a subsequent week. So I just created this little potential scenario here to illustrate a kind of guided discussion technique that you might use, particularly if you're having trouble getting your students to talk in class. So the instructor might pose a question like, oh, what do you think of this? What do you think of guided discussion, guys? And say, it's just crickets. No one's talking. Um, uh, one thing you could do is you could use a random name generator, and there are lots of these online. Um, or you could just randomly select someone from your class, uh, telling students that you're doing that, right? Being transparent about your use of this name generator. And then ask a, call out a particular student, right? This also shows that you care about them and their learning. So in this case, I'm using my daughter's name, Ellie. So Ellie, how would you blah, 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 uh, start a guided discussion? Um, and so Ellie might respond, oh, I think I would, uh, do this and this and this. And so you want to carry that thread forward and get other students involved. Acknowledge Ellie's contribution. Good point, Ellie. And then maybe say, you know, James, how would you connect with Ellie, connect Ellie's remark with blah, 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 right? So as you might do in an asynchronous discussion board, you're picking up on existing threads and, and pushing them forward. And again, you don't have to be the only one that does this. A student might could lead this, or a group of students could lead this during that guided discussion uh, part uh, of your course or your class session. And again, this is just one very simple approach. There are so many great ways that I'm sure you guys already know and are familiar with um, how to, to encourage students to talk and connect. Um, this is just one approach, but I do recommend that random name generator because again, it shows it is purely random. You're not showing preference um, or anything like that. And it looks like there's a post, right? Um, oh, Cindy said, use the date of the class and choose the student who is number 11 on the roster. And call. oh, I love that. And call on them first. Then they pick another student to answer the next question or make the next comment. That's a great idea. I love that. Any other ways that you guys have used or uh, hope to use guided discussion techniques in your course. Virtual mitten toss. I don't know that, Peg. It's essentially what Cindy was talking about. So oh, okay. In, in, in a regular classroom, in a, in when I'm live in front of people, I bring, I actually have a mitten in the office and I, because you can't throw <laughs> rocks at people. Um, so and, it, and it's dangerous to throw balls at people so i just throw a mitten at somebody and say tag you're it and then they i don't guide i don't guide the next step i don't have anything to do with who gets picked next whoever answered mm -hmm. the question then throws it which makes it takes all the pressure off love it makes more fun that's fun yeah and you could you know you this can be done virtually cindy's uh, approach very much lends itself to a virtual format right um and you could use, through your guided discussion, you may use chat, which you know it, I think is nice too, because it gives students that might be reluctant to talk out loud an opportunity to respond in a different way. 
um, and also you know, whiteboard and annotation tools, which students can also use, um, can help facilitate that. So one more before we move on to our last interaction for the day, um, group work. I know you guys all, all, all probably use group work in your um, classes. And I just created this word cloud based upon just you know, the, the, the first types of group activities that came to my mind. And there are so many more beyond this, but briefly wanna talk about the importance of think, pair, share, or, or the, uh, application of that in your in your class and role playing um, and you know group work is so important right not only is it active learning technique um, but it is primarily you know student led and peer driven as opposed to being faculty led so it really promotes student autonomy self regulated learning um, which is ultimately where you want to get your students at, right? Um, so that they are actively in control of their learning experience. And one thing I think is really important is that group work also promotes the construction of knowledge in a social setting. And this goes back to the theorist Lev Vygotsky's uh, socio-cultural theory of cognitive development that we learn in our interactions with others in groups, right? Um, so again, a really valuable technique for learning. Um, think, pair, share is quite simple, and you may do a version of this in your course already. Um, it is what it says, right? The students work together to solve a problem or answer a question. Uh, you may pose that question. They would initially think individually about that. Then they might pair uh, up either in pairs or in groups and share those ideas with one another. And then lastly, you might regroup and share with the group or class. So it offers opportunities for individual reflection, collaboration um, in smaller groups and with the class uh, all together. So it's a really wonderful, very uh, um, simple group activity to um, use. And then role play. I know be, I, I wanted to do this because a lot, and I will also so very quickly go through this because I want to leave some time for our last interaction, um, where students are put in groups and assigned roles in a scenario. Uh, you may all use this actively in your courses because you are often dealing with um, patient case scenarios, right? Um, but this is a wonderful way that you could, uh, a wonderful kind of approach you could use for your group uh, work sections of your course, uh, of your class time, um, ascribe or giving students potential roles in a scenario, um, a medical condition to address, and um, uh, results to record, as well as sharing those results with the group. Um, obviously, something like this requires quite a bit of planning and organization, right? So this would be maybe difficult to kind of do on um, uh, just you know, without much preparation, but um, it is a highly effective way, as you all probably well know, of um, applying knowledge um, in doing, you know, doing, right? Um, so Emily's going to wrap us up and talk a little more about how to get started, and then we'll have one final interactive element to close us out. All right, yeah, so uh, today we've prevent, presented a variety of strategies that you might think of incorporating into your class to make it a little more student-centered, but we really want to stress that it's really not an all or nothing thing that we, we've presented today. What we would encourage is that you might try adopting one or two new strategies you certainly don't need to revamp your whole your whole course structure or anything like that. Um, and we've tried to present strategies that you could introduce at any time in the semester. So we're just a little bit after midterm right now. So this might be a good time just to um, bring some novelty to your course and try a couple of different approaches for interactivity. Um, as you're planning on incorporating strategies, uh, you do want to be sure to um, align the activity with your lesson and your course level learning objectives. And if the activity seems 
rather novel to your students, you might be transparent about the fact that you're doing a specific activity. So explain that you're going to do it and try to explain how it might connect to learning objectives um, just as a way sometimes a little too much novelty is overwhelming to students back to the idea of cognitive load and um, it also might help promote further metacognitive skills for your students and of course you can always reach out to city i know any number of our instructional designers would be more than happy to help you develop activities that we've discussed or other wonderful activities as well and I think we're going to wrap up by having a brief activity also. And so what we'd like to ask is if you're willing to engage in a bit of reflection and I'll put the link in the chat so you can access it as well. This is um, Padlet and I know some of you are probably familiar with this tool. It's just like a kind of a virtual board that allows you to make a little posting and unless you're signed in it will be anonymous and today we're just asking you to think about some of the practices that you use in the class so you could post under what do i want to start doing and just put a little um like a virtual st sticky note about what you'd like to start doing is there a practice that you're currently doing that you'd like to stop or is there something that's going well and you'd like to continue using? All right, and we're getting some responses, so that's great. Oh, love it. Get people moving, yes. Oh, I like that. Yeah, and as we've talked about before, there are so many wonderful strategies you can use for um, those breaks, those moments in the class where students are, you know, taking a break, <laughs> a brain break from your, uh, from the course, more group work, saving questions only at the end. Oh, what you want to stop doing? Yes, okay, <laughs> I got a yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Saving questions only at the end, including too much information. That's great. Um, continue to use personal stories. Yes trying to make my slides visually interesting. And also if you have anything to contribute to this that you, and you're unable to add to the Padlet, feel free to put it in your in the chat or um, unmute yourself and answer verbally. Stop talking. <laughs> Love that. That's so hard. It's this hard, hard for me yeah. too, you know, obviously, because I've done a lot of it in this last hour. <laughs> As, well, I, I feel too, like, I know that everybody here is so, everybody here is so smart we all have everybody has so much information to impart and i know right. that when i teach i feel i feel responsible to give my students every single bit of information i've ever acquired about any particular topic because they're never going to see me again and right. realistically i don't have to do that i don't have to that's just my own that's just my own thing talking and uh -huh. sometimes it's better just to let other people you know other people will teach them too Yes, very true, right? As, as I've learned from uh, parenting my, my kids, right? Students, or kids learn the most from one another, <laughs> not necessarily from me. Yep, absolutely. All right, uh, use more assignments that sends them into the workplace. Oh, leadership challenges, that's mm -hmm. great, right? So maybe an opportunity for more uh, authentic assessments, right? Uh, uh, activities that directly apply to their future field of work. That's great. Idea. I love that we're using Padlet in this in this workshop. This is great. Stop using red or green text. Yes. And you know what? I was guilty of it even in this session. And I didn't realize that until you said that, Emily, I used a red underline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, even, you know, we make mistakes too, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's easy to do, but that's a very good point. Is this something that we can utilize Padlet? Is this rush? Is this something that you guys have or what? This is actually my personal account. You oh, can okay. um, create a Padlet account for free. And I, I believe uh, you can get up to like three boards, I think that you okay. can use for free before you have to start paying, if I'm not mistaken. Peg or Lynette or Emily, do you happen to know further? I think it's yes, three. It yeah, I'll put in the the site 
it's padlet.com mm -hmm. and you can have a free account that you can create three boards but in my experience you can make a board use it and delete it and keep using those three boards so it's oh. not a one-time thing i didn't realize that that's yeah. so oh that's a very good suggestion yeah and there's all different types of formats you can use you know this is the i believe the column approach but you know there's there's the grid there's the timeline there's the map um there's all really there's a variety of different kinds of wonderful interactions so i encourage you to explore it if you haven't already um it is yeah. now 301 so i want to make sure that we wrap up for those of you that need to run off, um, thank you so much for attending. Emily and I really appreciate it. Here's our email should you want to reach out to us. Uh, I think many of you have it already. Um, and we also have our sources here. So we're happy to provide you with um, a link to this presentation if you would like to return to it at a later time. Um, but I'm happy to stick around for a bit longer if any of you have questions or would like to talk through anything else. But again, thank you so much.